again, welcome and thank you. It is the custom of this committee to ask those members who are about to give testimony to uh, stand and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record show that each of the witnesses has indicated in the affirmative. Your entire statements have been entered into the record, and I'll just do a brief introduction of our second panel. Mr. William Burris is president of the American Postal Workers Union. Mr. Burris is also a member of the executive committee of the Union Network International, which is a global federation of unions that represents postal and other service workers. Mr. John Hegarty is the president of the National Postal Mail Handlers Union. Prior to becoming national president, Mr. Hegarty served as president of Local 301 in New England, which serves my home district, which is the second largest local union affiliated with the Mail Handlers Union. Mr. Dale Goff is in his 39th year with the United States Postal Service. He began as a postal assistant in New Orleans. Mr. Goff has been a member of the National Association of Postmasters for 29 years, where his positions have included state president, national vice president, and national president. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, as you have uh, been frequent flyers to this committee in the past, I don't have to explain the rules. Uh, Mr. Burris, you are currently recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, our friend, my friend, uh, Bill Young, is not present. Do I get his five minutes? Well, he, he gets his on the next hearing. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for affording our union the opportunity to express our views on the important topics of this hearing, especially at this time of reduced mail volume and revenue. The postal community is unanimous in our conclusion that immediate relief from the obligation to fund retirees' health care benefits from the postage operating budget is paramount. We need your help in navigating the legislative process to ensure that the Postal Service receive this desperately needed change in policy. Without it, the Postal Service will be unable to adapt and to survive. But adjusting the payment method of retiree health care benefits is just one option the Postal Service is pursuing. And it is only a short-term fix to stave off imminent collapse. It will not address the long-term challenges. The Postal Service is also engaged in many other efforts to reduce uh, costs, even as it overlooks the fundamental continuing cause of its financial difficulties. These actions are having a detrimental effect on service and often generate little or no savings. Postal attempts at network realignment are a case in point. The Postal Service first announced it would overhaul the mail processing network where it released its original transformation plan in April of 2002, but it ignored demands from legislators and workers for details about where, when, and how consolidations would take place. To date, the service has refused to provide specifics of its plans or the criteria it relies upon when selecting facilities for consolidations. Many of the early announcements of consolidated generated strenuous opposition from workers and affected communities. In 2006 and 2007, 37 of the 50 consolidations were terminated, placed on hold, or reversed. During this time period, the Postal Service was the subject of severe criticism by the GAO for the lack of transparency in its planning efforts and for failing to allow for sufficient input from workers, citizens, and public officials in affected communities. The Postal, Service, the Postal Regulatory Commission also disapproved of the service consolidation efforts. And to make matters worth, worse, there is no conclusive evidence to support postal claims that plant consolidation will lead to greater efficiency or savings. And despite management's assurance to the contrary, citizens, community leaders, small business owners, and postal workers are concerned that a realigned mail processing ne network will reduce service and delay the delivery of mail. The danger is clear. If service to small businesses and individual citizens is permitted to decline, it could lead to the demise of the institution. Regrettably, the Post Service has consistently failed to share an overview, overview of its network realignment plans with the American Postal Workers Union. Despite repeated requests and a national level grievance, postal officials, however, have given an in-depth presentation about the plan to the Mailers Technical Advisory Committee 
an organization representing the interests of major mailers. Management has finally scheduled a union briefing that is scheduled to take place next week. However, even if we overlook the faults, the service's cost-cutting efforts are subverted by its postage rate strategy, which dramatically reduces revenue from major mailers without a corresponding reduction in service. And I note uh, the testimony that preceded this panel, uh, there was not a mention about the rates. The Post Service business model is based on the erroneous premise that discounts for large mailers increase volume. However, a review of the effects of three decades, three decades of rate manipulation reveals that discounts have failed to boost first class volume. The graph appended to my testimony shows the effect of rate changes on volume and demonstrates that despite disproportionate increases in postage discounts, volume has been unaffected. This flawed rate policy subsidizes large mailers at the expense of American citizens and jeopardizes the viability of the United States Postal Service. Rates for major mailers have been manipulated to the extent that they pay as little as 76% of the official first class rate for the same level of service. A two-tier rate structure has evolved and with the implementation of the previously mentioned cost-cutting initiatives, two levels of services are emerging, one for the large mailers and another for private citizens. The second appendix to my testimony, attachment number two, illustrates the, the discrepancy. Letter number one is the typical first-class business letter that qualifies for the work share discount. Because the mailer affixed the barcode that appears at the bottom of the letter, the post service reduced the first-class first rate from 44 cents to 33.5 cents, a discount of 24 percent. Letter two is also prepared by the business mailer, with the barcode placed at the top of the address window. However, the postage is paid by the recipient of letter number one, the average American citizen. The cost, 44 cents, the full first-class rate, even though the letter also contains a barcode, is prepared identically to the discounted piece and requires the same amount of work by the Postal Service. The efforts to reduce costs, plants consolidation, massive employee reassignments, reduce retail hours, and the reduction of neighborhood collection boxes will have a devastating effect on service, and faulty rate strategy has drained much needed revenue, threatening the viability of the institution. Passing H.R. 22 will provide the Postal Service immediate relief, but the long-term solution to the crisis is to end the policy of subsidizing large mailers at the expense of the American citizens and the Postal Service. Without congressional intervention, the noble mission of the Postal Service, and I quote, to bind the nation together through the personal, educational, literary, and business correspondence to the people, and to provide prompt, reliable, and efficient services to patrons in all communities, end quote, will be no more than pros. We can do better than that. And we need your leadership, Mr. Chairman, to achieve those objectives. Thank you, Mr. Boris. Mr. Hegarty. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Mem Member Chaffetz, and the other members of the subcommittee for calling this hearing. Uh, you've asked for testimony today focusing on the impact that the Postal Service is cost-cutting uh, is having on postal operations and the postal network. Responses from the Postal Service to the current economic crisis include a blanket hiring freeze for virtually all career positions, a reduction in overtime hours, and a drastic reduction in total career positions. Indeed, in just the last 18 months, the Postal Service has reduced career positions by more than 40,000 employees. Another aspect of the Postal Service's cost-cutting program, and one in which mail handlers are more familiar, our efforts to reduce the number of facilities and or to shift operations in the postal network through its area mail processing or AMP guidelines. It has, as I said in my written statement, been a rough road with many starts and stops along the way. The Postal Service has received much criticism from many stakeholders. Recently, the Postal Service has sent to this point at least 35 notices in which it announced that it intends to perform a feasibility study to determine if the movement of certain mail processing would help to eliminate excess capacity and or would allow the Postal Service to make more efficient use of existing facilities. 
Mr. Chairman, there is a need to ensure the short-term financial viability of the Postal Service and the long-term financial viability. It may require the closing and consolidation of certain postal facilities, but there is also the need to ensure that service does not decline and that the future postal network is not cut too severely such that the Postal Service will not be prepared to provide universal and low-cost service when mail volumes recover. Our suggested solution is to approach these issues on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, suppose there are two mail processing facilities only a few miles apart and both of those facilities are underutilized and the work at the smaller facility simply can be consolidated into the larger installation without disruption. Or perhaps one facility is much more dilapidated than the other. Or perhaps one facility is governed by an expensive lease whereas the other building is actually owned by the Postal Service. Where the proposal makes economic and logistical sense, where service standards will not be negatively affected, where major mailers in the area will not be inconvenienced, and where all negotiated requirements with the unions have been complied with, then the mail handlers union will not simply oppose for the sake of opposition. Conversely, the Postal Service should not be conducting an AMP study just to show that they are doing something. In those cases where it makes sense, the Mail Handlers Union focuses on minimizing the dislocation and inconvenience that might be suffered to our employees. We have negotiated contractual provisions which require the Postal Service to give its unions and its employees advance notice of any proposed closings or consolidations. We also have negotiated provisions which obligate the Postal Service to ensure that dislocation and inconvenience to its employees in the regular workforce shall be kept to a minimum. And that's a quote right out of our collective bargaining agreement. If each of these provisions were properly implemented, we would not have as many problems as we are currently facing. Unfortunately, the rational and realistic approach does not always control the day. First, the Postal Service often announces proposals that have no realistic chance of being approved, thereby causing panic among postal employees and customers and political up upheaval that is sometimes worse than the proposal itself. Second, even when the proposed closing or consolidation is eventually approved and implemented, the Postal Service does not always follow its contractual obligation to its employees. The best way to minimize hardships is to discuss the matter with the unions and management associations even before the proposal is announced publicly. The Postal Service consults with its major mailers or other customers and considers the views of the community leadership but it also must consult with its unions at the local and national levels. The parties would be well served to discuss these proposals before a feasibility study is publicly announced and the same message should get out to local union representatives and local management. This hearing will certainly help us to reach that goal. Turning back to the financial situation now facing the Postal Service, I would like to reiterate my organization's wholehearted support for H.R. 22 which would provide the Postal Service with some much needed relief by slowing down but not eliminating the USPS pre-funding requirement for retiree health care benefits without endangering the health care benefits of current or future retirees. Again, thank you for your time and attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Haggerty. Mr. Goff, for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am once again honored to speak with this subcommittee about our national postal system and the economic climate in which it serves the American public. I think it is important to underscore that the underlying cause of the USPS's dire financial situation is the weakness of the U.S. economy. In addition, if the agency was not required to pre-fund its retiree health costs, its financial picture would be infinitely better. NAPA strongly believes that the justification for short-term legislative help has not abated. Consequently, we urge Congress to proceed as expeditiously as possible with such relief. Today, NAPIS will discuss the postal retail network. Postmasters are the managers in charge of post offices. Therefore, we are uniquely positioned to provide insight into the retail network operations from the ground level. First, permit me to state that NAPIS does not believe every postal facility in the country should be immune from closure or consolidation. If the Postal Service follows the law and established regulations, constructively consults with its frontline management team, and communicates clearly with the affected community, network right-sizing is achievable. On the other hand, arbitrary facility closings, consolidation for consolidation's sake, is not a wise strategy. 
Consolidating or closing a postal facility without regard to its impact on the overall network is counterproductive and will cost the Postal Service revenue in the long run. The subcommittee needs to co consider, as part of its review of retail operations, the USPS's universal service, service obligation and how a closing or consolidation impacts both the impacted community as well as the network itself. It is important to recognize that not all facilities are similar. Of the 36,723 retail and delivery postal facilities, 27,232 are post offices, 4,851 are branches or stations, 658 are carrier annexes, 3,148 are contract postal units, and 834 are community post offices. Contract postal units and community post offices are not operated by the U.S. Postal Service and consequently cannot offer the full menu of postal products and services. Branches, stations, annexes, contract postal units and community post offices are all subordinate to a local post office. In many towns and villages, the only access to postal services is their post office. Furthermore, only post offices are singled out in Title 39 of the United States Codes for special protection against closing for solely economic reasons. Far-flung, isolated communities throughout the nation use their post office as community centers, banks, pharmacies, and as the nexus for vital government services. In addition to being a revenue-producing or origination point, post offices are also the destination point of mailed matter. Secure post office boxes and distribution points for accountable mail characterize post offices. It is important to note that even if you closed every small and rural post office in the United States, you would save only $586 million, a mere eight-tenths of 1% of the USPS operating budget. Mr. Chairman, indeed, there are savings to be realized in the retail network through the elimination of senseless requirements that add work hours and costs to postal operations. For example, the USPS Mystery Shopper Program wastes postal revenue. PRC Chairman Dan Blair recently remarked that the program is not statistically valid, and as a consequence, the Commission does not use the data as part of its annual compliance determination. The Mystery Shopper Program squanders postal dollars and should be terminated. In addition, postal districts contribute significant and unnecessary costs to retail operations. Many of their make-work directives add no value to postal products, nor do the orders improve customer service. These pointless initiatives waste time and money. For example, some postmasters are required to file a tracking report. Get this, to track if the postmasters are completing the other requested reports. Talk about folly and redundancy. In order to save cost, I encourage the Postmaster General to negotiate with our unions about cross-craft training. An agreement in this area would enhance the skills of individual postal employees and enable postmasters to more effectively utilize their talents. On the other side of the ledger, the Postal Service has done away with programs that actually could reduce costs. For example, the Postal Service suspended managerial training. The result is that postmasters are denied necessary instruction and tools to more effectively operate their facilities and save money for their post office. In addition, the agency has eliminated or curtail revenue generating vending machines and automated postal centers. Mr. Chairman, understandably, the task that we confront is dawning. However, the bottom line is that we must protect postal universality. Postmasters remain committed to working with Congress and towards protecting the Postal Service as a national treasure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Goff. I, I thank you all. I yield myself uh, five minutes. I just want to, as a, as a threshold comment, uh, each of you talked about H.R. 22. Uh, if, if all had gone as planned, uh, we would have marked that up at today's hearing. However, as part of uh, the markup and, and the whole amendment process, uh, one of the critical pieces of information is really the CBO scoring of how much a particular piece of legislation will cost, what the cost associated with that would be. 
and fairness to CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, they have a lot on their plate right now, and they thought it would take a bit more time, maybe a week, to get the hard numbers on the CBO scoring on this bill, H.R. 22. So what we will do is, as soon as we come back after the memorial uh, break, we'll come back in, and at the first available opportunity, we will mark that up. Uh, we should note, however, that uh, there will be benchmarks in that bill. There's relief in that bill, as you've requested, but also within that bill there are benchmarks about cost savings. Uh, for the current year, I think the Postal Service has already accomplished what they need to do, if, if their numbers are valid, and I, I believe that in a large degree they are. But there are also uh, cost reduction requirements going forward. Uh, in, in, in the years uh, uh, described in the bill. And also, uh, there is also a provision where if the economy does turn around and the post office starts generating uh, sufficient revenues, then there's a pour over provision that uh, money gets diverted back into the, the trust fund. Uh, and so uh, we don't allow that to go on forever. We understand the relief that's needed in the, long, in the short term but in the long term, we think we cannot suffer those, uh, the unfunded liability that would accrue if we just allow this to go on perpetually. So uh, <clears throat> in any event, we'll, we'll obviously have a markup on this in a couple of weeks and, and, uh, and go forward. Uh, I want to thank you for your testimony. L let me cut to the chase. There, there has been significant reduction in costs already, and you and I commend you on your cooperation and working with the post office and accomplishing that. None of it could have been done without your, your help. However, we are getting to uh, a situation where the cuts go closer to the bone in some cases, where we've got to look at retail operations. Uh, oddly enough, more, more often in heavily, I have a district that is two cities, Boston and Brockton, and I have 19 towns. Um, the, the instances where post offices are located very close to each other happen to be in, in the major cities. Uh, as you know, I was a former iron worker, and it seemed like every time we threw up a, a high rise of 30 stories or more, there was a post office that went right in that building, and the volume of mail at that time certainly justified it. Uh, so now we have situations in some of our major cities where you got, you know, four or five high rises in a very close proximity and you've got four or five post postal facilities inside each each of those uh, you know a retail shop inside each of those high rises we're going to have to look at some of that and uh, we're going to need your cooperation to look at you know some of these facilities where we have redundancy that might have been justified in earlier days when we had higher volume but now we've got to we've got to look we only have a number of options we have you know raising rates again that is, a, you know, that's distasteful. A direct appropriation to the post office for the first time. A lot of people think that the post office is run by tax money. It's run by revenue. But we're looking at a situation where if the post office runs out of money, as uh, Mr. Galligan explained earlier today, uh, they would be looking for some type of bailout. They have a statutory limit as to what they can borrow. And... If they could not make that obligated payment on September 30th into the into the you know the fund, they they would be in violation of the law. So, uh, and the trend is not good. I mean, every single witness today that has opined on the uh, likelihood of recovery in 2010 has basically said 2010 looks as bad, if not worse, than 2009. And, and these are historic drops in volume uh, on the, the order of, uh, you know, 1929 and, and the Great Crash. So what can you, what can you tell me about uh, efforts to, to create some efficiencies here, consolidate uh, where we have uh, du du duplicative uh, services? H how do we get there? Uh, and, and obviously, with accommodations to your employees, uh, without layoffs, we're talking about voluntary uh, attrition uh, meeting the goals of uh, reduction in force. 
how, how do we work together to get there on some of these uh, facilities that need to be closed? I'll go first. Um, my union uh, stands ready and willing to be an active partner with the Post Service, with this committee, with the Congress in finding efficiencies in the Post Service. Um, the previous panel was testifying about efforts that have been uh, underway in, in the past, and those cuts that have been made, 70 percent of all those cuts have been in my bargaining unit. Uh, my bargaining unit has been cut in half over 100,000 employees within the bargaining unit. So any suggestion uh, by postal management that the unions may be uncooperative, well, they have pulled over 100,000 employees out of the people that I represent. But I think the, the, the basic flaw of the Postal Service efforts is, in their efficiency efforts, is that they have viewed the network as the postal network, the 400 plants, 400 plus plants, the 37,000 facilities. Those, are, those facilities under the direct control of the United States Post Service, postal employees are employed. They view that as the universe where savings can be achieved. The network consists of much broader uh, uh, facilities than just the post service facilities, and they're funded through the rate schedule. We provide funding for over 100 facilities scattered throughout the country that provide the same services that we provide within the post service, processing and transportation. They are not being reviewed. Those our machines, the machines that the employees that I represent uh, function on, they, their efficiency rate is 37,000 pieces per hour. Now, if there's 8 percent discounts on every letter that goes through there, that's the wage rate that the post service is paying for those private corporations to perform the exact same function that the employees I represent are performing. So if they are willing to put everybody in the pot, everybody, everybody that plays a role in the posters processing, transportation, collection, and delivery network into the pot and say, where can all of us, where can we find efficiencies, then we're a willing partner. We want to participate in that. But don't just look at part of that network and impose a disproportionate share of the savings on that segment. And that's what's happening. Fair enough. Mr. Haggerty. Uh, yes, I, you know, I think hard choices have to be made, but I think the key is going to be communications and input and have the Postal Service have some meaningful dialogue with, with the unions and management associations. I think we've started doing that. I'll, I'll give uh, Postmaster General Potter credit for, for calling much more frequent meetings with the organizations. We met probably six or seven times in the last uh, eight months, which is uh, much more frequently than we had been meeting. Um, but, you know, the Postal Service also needs to be realistic. As I said in my testimony, if a consolidation or closing makes sense, we're willing to work with the Postal Service. We need to reduce the impact on our employees. Um, we signed a memorandum of understanding back in 2003 that requires the Postal Service and the union to meet at the headquarters level to discuss Article 12 impacts and to discuss workforce repositioning issues. We've started those meetings once this came to the forefront that the AMP studies were going forward, and we're making some progress with that. Um, but there are still the, the horror stories out there. We were recently notified that they were going to involuntarily excess employees from Memphis, Tennessee to Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's 400 miles away. Uh, a postal employee who has a career or made a career decision to work for the Postal Service now has a very hard choice. Do they leave the place they grew up? where their kids are going to school, where their spouse may have a good job, to follow their postal job 400 miles away, uproot their family, try to sell their house in this terrible real estate market, or do they just give up their job with the Postal Service? So those are the choices that some of our employees are facing, and we're really trying to minimize those types of choices. Um, other ways that we've tried to save the Postal Service money, I mentioned at the last hearing that all the unions and management associations have uh, agreed to voluntary uh, voluntarily increase the health care contributions. That uh, total that we estimated last time over five years with all employees together is saving the Postal Service $800 million over the five years. Uh, we've also agreed to very reasonable 
uh, contracts in our uh, contract negotiations with the Postal Service in our collective bargaining agreements. For instance, postal employees, most postal employees, my bargaining unit specifically, will receive a 1.2 percent raise this year while government employees are in line for a 2.9 percent raise. So not only have we accepted uh, smaller wage increases and increased health care contributions, so we're working with the Postal Service. One other thing I'd like to point out in this particular segment is uh, the fact that the Postal Service still has uh, some uh, operations out subcontracted. They are paying other people to perform work that career postal employees could be performing and in fact should be performing. In fact, you have clerks, mail handlers, and other postal employees around the country sometimes clocked onto standby time, which means clock onto a specific operation number and go sit in the break room until we need you. And they'll spend hours in there doing nothing, getting paid by the Postal Service while we have contract employees performing empty equipment duties, uh, sorting duties at what they used to call the HASP, the hug and sp uh, hub and spoke uh, processing facilities. There are at least three of those major facilities that are totally non-postal, and that is work that postal employees should be doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haggerty. Mr. Goff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to say, just as Mr. Burris said and Mr. Haggerty, that the first thing that comes to mind is that we have to communicate with each other. Whether we're management or we're craft or we're headquarters or we're the people on the front line, we have to communicate. And we've done that to some extent. But it's, as I said in my testimony, not for the sake of just saying we've communicated or to let the committee know that we've been meeting. You know, we have to communicate to the point that if we've got viable solutions and recommendations that, that we've brought to these meetings, then we need to follow through and talk about them some more and put those things on the table. We've had the frequent meetings. You know, there's also the provision, as I said in my testimony with the law, as far as consolidating facilities and closing facilities. If we follow the law, I don't think there's anybody who would dispute if it's done the right way and it's proven that that facility is not needed then we can go ahead and agree to that situation. It's when we go in there and we're arbitrarily suspending post offices now and we're doing the different things. Urban area, rural area, as you've heard me say before, are two different things. You know, if we've got the consolidated or we've got the, the concentration of branches in a big city, we've also got those areas out in the rural area where there's not another post office for 200 miles away. So we need to really preserve those facilities. You know, there's a lot of things that postmasters, even the craft has done, the clerks, and, and everybody has been involved with. We, we've got into some programs to help generate revenue. We've all backed that. Even the mail handlers have jumped in to, to do some of those programs. You know, postmasters have eBay days to get people that, that, that deal in the eBay. They're in there telling them how to do it and how to use our products to generate revenue. We have passport days. It's all ways that we can come, you know, special cancellations when there's something unique to that community where we can generate revenue. So th there's many things that we can do. The overall thing is, and I think we all understand, is that, yes, we've got to make some major changes to go forward. And the best way to do that is that we all communicate together. I mean, it's, it's a pleasure for me to sit here with two of the craft presidents, you know, of the unions to have a management president sitting with them to testify at the same time. That goes a long way. We have a great working relationship, all of us, that we talk back and forth and we support each other on a lot of things. Sometimes Mr. Burris goes the other way with us, but that's all right. But we do have a great working relationship and we've got to keep that communication open and I think that's the biggest thing to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Goff. The chair now recognizes the gentleman, the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz from Utah for 10 minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate the big group hug that's going on there at the table. That's great. Um, it, it, if you could each maybe take a moment um, and just from your perspective, your thoughts on five-day delivery. And, and let's just mix things up and start with Mr. Haggerty this time. We'll get, let Mr. Burke first go last here. Thank you. Um, I, I said at the previous hearing that I was concerned that five-day delivery may drive uh, mail volume down may drive some of our volumes to our competitors. Uh, it may uh, cause people to pay their bills online, to do their banking online, and, and I still think that's the case. I, I'm a little bit worried, uh, especially I, I think we discussed it at the last hearing about when there's a holiday weekend. 
Uh, you have Saturday, no Saturday delivery, no Sunday delivery, no Monday delivery. Uh, now the, the first day you're going to get your mail between Friday and, and over the weekend is going to be Tuesday. So um, if I'm a consumer and my you know, electric bill is late and I get assessed a penalty or my MasterCard bill is late or my bank statement doesn't uh, arrive on time and I'm, I'm unable to reconcile how much I have in the bank and I overdraw a check, I'm just going to go online and start paying my bills online and, and you know, so I'm concerned with that and that's, that's business that will never come back. Um, we have a competitive advantage in that we deliver on Saturdays uh, with no extra cost to the consumers. We don't have fuel charges. Uh, uh, some other uh, uh, competitors do. So I'm, I'm very concerned that five-day delivery will co cause a big drop in volume. Okay. Thank uh, you. On the other hand, I think we need to be realistic. If that's the only way for the Postal Service to survive, and as Mr. Galligan described, they're still going to have uh, retail open on Saturdays. Uh, if they were still going to deliver packages, say, instead of you know, cutting just out the letters, um, and it's a substantial savings, and it's you know, thoroughly uh, looked at by not just the Postal Service but the other agencies, then we may have to accept that down the road. Mr. Goff. Previously, I, I stated that our organization was not in favor of the five-day delivery, and I still say that at this point. You know, we've heard this morning some different figures from the last hearing that we've had. My concern is, is that when we all come together and agree on one type of uh, figure for our savings, then I can possibly agree with this. But when we're, you know, we're so far off on the different figures that, you know, I still have concerns about that. Just as Mr. Haggerty said, my concern is, is that every Monday, if we go with the Saturday as not being the day, would be that day after a holiday. We'd spend whatever we saved on that Saturday we'd be spending on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday catching up for what was there for that weekend. So that's my biggest concern with it. And I, I'm not sure that the cost is there that everybody says. And I think that we need to take some time and not overreact the way we're doing right now to say five-day delivery is our savior. I don't think that's going to be the savior. We need to take some time to look at this. And if the economy ever recovers, and none of us know when that's going to happen, you know, people are going to come back to ad mail. They're going to come back to the mailers out there and say, hey, you're the best bargain around, and we're going to use you again because we've got our economy back, and we've got a budget that we can start spending on mail again. So. Thank you. And, I, 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 you know, this, this assessment of the dollars, Mr. Chairman, I think is, it has been quite varied. I, I, I do not feel comfortable that we've uh, identified what those potential savings could be, what the, what the ultimate costs are. I have heard a huge swing in numbers, and, and I would concur with you that I don't think we've fully assessed not only the economic and emotional impact of, and, and re business relationships that we have with our big mailers, but what the true savings and costs are. And let me also say, as we go to Mr. Burris here, I really do appreciate that I've, I'm getting the very strong impression the unions are doing everything they can to work with all aspects, and I, I appreciate the, the approach. Uh, there have been a significant number uh, and re of people uh, through various reductions and whatnot, and I, I applaud you all for your, your proactive and positive uh, approach to it. So, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Burris, uh, your, your comments on a five-day. Uh, I think it's an act of desperation. Uh, perhaps we're at the point where the only things left are acts of desperation, but I think it would be, it would be the beginning of the end. I think once you legally permit another carrier to assume the responsibility of the post service on any of the six days of the week, let's assume it's Saturday, I think that will add to the diversion of mail to uh, electronic means, uh, the economic, the shift from a debt-driven uh, society to one that engages in savings and is not our volume does not follow the request for credit cards and the other things that drive the commercial activities. Uh, I think that going from a six-day delivery to five-day delivery may hasten the demise of the post service. Uh, somebody is going to deliver on that sixth day. Whether if the post service abandons it, somebody is going to pick it up gladly. A customer mailing a item on Wednesday. Uh, that in normal three-day delivery would have been delivered on Saturday, would not receive delivery until Monday. Uh, somebody's going to fill that void. And I think any diversion of 5%, 10%, 15% of the volume where another carrier moves into that opening, I think will just accelerate uh, 
the, the demise of the Postal Service. So I think, I don't think Congress will approve to begin with, and I think discussing it sucks the oxygen out of everything else because it's such an issue that resonates with the American public. You tell the public that they may not get delivery one day of the week. They're not paying attention to uh, the, the H.R. 22 and the impact of that and other requests for relief the posters has made. Those go from the front page to the back page. And everything the media focuses on is the reduction of delivery. I think it's gonna, not going to come about, but if it did, I think it would be a big mistake big mistake. I think that uh, FedEx, UPS, and delivery carriers that are not in the business of day would pick up that opportunity. And if they can do it on Saturday, they can do it on Thursday at the same time the post is, is delivering. So you'd have dual delivery forces out there. Thank you. And uh, in the essence of time and the call to votes, so I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri. Thank Mr. You. Clay for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be as brief as possible. Uh, let me start with the entire panel. This is a panel-wide question. Uh, can you tell us how your union or management association working with the Postal Service, how are you working with the Postal Service to address uh, its current financial difficulties and what specific actions have been taken or are being considered by your union or association. I'll start with Mr. Burris. Yes. Uh, presently, we're not working with them. We have offered. Uh, they have made their plans in isolation. They have gone forward with them. We have applied the provisions of our contract, and we're appropriate. We would oppose them. But there are no joint efforts presently. That we're certainly involved in uh, some of the efforts to build volume. I and mean, those are collective efforts in that regard. But in terms of this, the, the efforts to downsize, consolidations, uh, they just give us notices uh, when they think of it. There are often times that we don't get the notice timely, and we find out from the news reports in the location where the consolidation is taking place. But there are no collective efforts with my union. We are the largest postal union. There are no joint efforts with us uh, to uh, initiate efficiencies and come up with a rational plan, as I included in my testimony. Uh, this uh, consolidation plan that's been driven by the mailing, the large mailing industry, we had a contractual language in 2001 that said we would sit down and develop a consolidation plan jointly. They have not given us a consolidation plan, and we're years into that process. So there are no joint efforts in that regard. We stand available and willing to engage in them. We certainly will apply the provisions of our contract because we have secured rights that we have negotiated and we expect them to be enforced. But within the parameters of those collective bargaining agreements, we believe there's a lot of room for us to have some joint efforts. Uh, we are on the cusp of getting into a serious issue. They have trained. We have 37,000 post offices, 17,000 of them, where I have bargaining unit employees, and there is no union representation. Even though they're covered by my collective bargaining agreement, there's no stewards or officers in those facilities. And what management has done is systematically taken the bargaining unit work and given it to non bargaining unit employees. Uh, it's a program. Take clerk work given to an employee who is guaranteed eight hours a day to fulfill their daily schedule. And we're going to have a national effort to return that work. That's going to cost posters millions of dollars. Thank you for that response. Mr. Haggerty, how, how is your union? Do you have a working relationship with the post? We do have a working relationship. I agree with President Burris, though, that it could be better. And, and we are also willing to work with the Postal Service at the headquarters level to, to do whatever we need to do, you know, to, to cause them uh, to save money. There are a couple of things I highlighted in my testimony a month ago that we are currently engaged in. One is the ergonomic risk reduction process where we evaluate a facility with specific, uh, specifically trained people on how to improve the operations, make them more ergonomically uh, friendly so that employees aren't uh, risking repetitive motion injuries and sustaining uh, injuries that would cause the po cost the Postal Service uh, a lot of money down the road in uh, workers' compensation costs. The same thing with the Voluntary Protection Program, which uh, we partner with the APW and OSHA and the Postal Service. 
uh, to reduce injuries in a building, to evaluate a building, and, and to make that facility qualify. They have to meet some stringent guidelines established by OSHA to reduce injuries and, again, save the Postal Service money. We also continue to participate in the quality of working life process, which is a cooperative uh, working process where uh, postal employees from the workroom floor meet with their supervisor in what's called quality circles and they brainstorm on ways to do the job better, do the job more efficiently, and all of those save the Postal Service substantial amounts of money as well. Thank you for your response. Mr. Goff, how have the postmasters worked with the service? As far as having specific actions right at the moment, uh, the only thing that I can say on that is that we're always continuously having off-the-record talks about different ways of doing things that we approach each and every day. You know, as John and Bill have said, we, we've sat there, we've worked. A lot of times we get told about things that are being done when it's already happening out in the field or somebody in the field tells us about it, and then we have to go back. And unlike them, we don't have a collective bargaining agreement, but we have the parts that we should be consulting on. And I think that that's a bit something that we all have to work on and improving a whole lot more. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your indulgence. I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Clay. Uh, here's how I'd like to handle this. Uh, I, I, we have five minutes left on this vote, and then there will be a little delay. Why don't I do this? Why don't I ask Mr. Goff, Mr. Hegarty, Mr. Burris, I'm going to give you these three minutes. Uh, any points that we have not hit upon in our questions or points that you'd like to amplify for the committee, uh, I, I'd like to hear them now. Uh, and then uh, I'll be able to dismiss this panel so you will be free for the day. And then we can, I'll go over and vote and then we'll come back and take the next panel, but everybody will be able to stretch their legs. How about that? Uh, Mr. Goff, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, I'd, I'd like to sit here and say, and, and absence of time is that I have nothing further to add. Uh, in my written testimony and what I gave verbally today is I think uh, expresses our concerns about the Postal Service. Being a 39-year veteran in this service, I want to see this institution stay around for another 200 years. So do I. Thank you. Mr. Hegarty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we've covered pretty much everything that, that I had thought of for today, I, I guess what I would say is that the Postal Service needs to be more proactive in their communications, not just at the headquarters level, but with the craft employees and, and you know, work with us so that we don't, as, as President Goff has pointed out, find out something after it's already been rolled out or a program when it's 99.9% .9 completed and they say, what do you think of this program? We're thinking of rolling it out. Well, our input at that point is really meaningless. So I think communications is the key. And, and as I highlighted earlier, the, the situation of the, the folks in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, being offered almost an impossible choice. I think we need to find a way around that. We need to work whether yeah. uh, that's uh, you know working with local management, regional, having our regional people sit down with their regional people. There has to be a better way. There has yeah. to be a better way with that. Thank you, Mr. Barris. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I um, I've been a postal employee within the Post Service for 55 years now, a long time. And I've seen uh, the changes that have occurred over that extended period of time from uh, manual, mechanized, automated, electronic. Uh, I've seen the rise of UPS and FedEx. I've seen a number of postal service initiatives to expand beyond hard copy communications. Uh, I understand and appreciate that uh, it is facing significant challenges at the present time. Uh, there is no guarantee that 10 years from now, representatives of my union and postal officials will follow on a panel representing the United States Postal Service in its present form. Uh, it's a real danger that if they run out of money, if they can't pay their bills, there's no justification for their continued existence. So I have that as a serious concern, and I am concerned about postal management's effort to make their plans and develop all of their strategies uh, with the large mailers. There is no input by the average citizens. Uh, the only uh, effect that they have with average citizens is the, increase, the annual increase in postage. There's no consultation with the citizens. There's no uh, input by those people that have their uh, 
medicines delivered by mail. They send their birthday cards, Christmas cards. It's only 4% of volume today, so it's not a sizable number. But they are the purpose for the United States Post Service. And the Post Service really has no program designed to, better, to improve conditions for those employees. And with the workers, uh, as I testified, uh, my bargaining unit has suffered significant erosions of number of employees. Over 100,000 fewer jobs exist today than did 10 years ago. Last year, as testified, some 30,000 fewer jobs. That's understandable in the context of the entire system. When it's isolated, I've had several meetings with the Postmaster General, I pointed out to him, it's got to be spread more evenly. Uh, we are not the only bargaining unit in the post service. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's spreading to other elements within the postal system. To date, there's no indication that they're moving in that direction. As I said, there are people doing the same work, workers doing the same work that my members are performing, and the post service compensates, not the individual, but the company, over $300 an hour. Now, if you're willing to pay $300 an hour to have the same work performed by the employees I represent, and you say you have too many of those, you've got to reduce their numbers. Uh, there's something wrong there, and my members will react, react as well as my union. Thank you. Uh, in, in conclusion, I just want to say, and I know we have some of the Postal Service uh, managers still, still in the audience uh, and, and watching. Uh, number one, people hate change. That goes for the American uh, male customer and as well as employees and when there's big change you got to bring them along and explain it and you know we in Congress we hate surprises and if we're going to make the changes necessary at the post office in a way that maintains respect for our employees and maintains uh, superior service to our uh, our customers of the post office then it needs to be a process that is collaborative so a message to the post office, I hate these stories where the post office just marches along in its own direction without talking to its employee representatives. That cannot happen. If there's any obstruction to this whole deal on HR 22 and, and going forward, it will be uh, a lack of consultation with the employees who are affected and the uh, mailing customers who are affected as well as uh, the relevant members of Congress who are dealing at the front lines with this issue. So that needs to happen. I hope Mr. Potter is listening. Uh, we need to work with, with folks, especially when there's relocations involved, like the Memphis situation. That is a disaster. Uh, and, and they need to take a good second look at that, as well as some other stories that I'm hearing around the country. I want to thank you for your testimony. Uh, I, I appreciate you coming here and helping us with our work. And uh, I'm going to run over and vote, hopefully, and I'll be back. But uh, this panel is dismissed. Thank you. Have Thank a good you. day.